There's a thing that happens with guitar players, and probably all musicians, uh, you let your fingers do their thing and kind of stand back and listen. Or maybe you don't, maybe you just zone out or whatever. There's plenty of people that just do wiggling, you know. And that's one kind of playing. There's another kind of playing where you actually hear something in your mind and then you have the skill and the wherewithal to find it. I feel like the best thing I can do is try to play what I'm hearing. Hey there, I'm Little John. You're watching Guitar Magic. And today, we're both going to learn something important from Tim Lurch. If you're a blues, jazz, or fingerstyle guitar nerd, I personally would be shocked if you've not seen one of Tim's videos on YouTube yet. Tim's been based in the Pacific Northwest since the late 80s, although at one point he did join a monastery and completely dropped out of the guitar scene for about a dozen years. And that's... it's interesting, and you'll hear more about it. Anyway, since 2006, he's been playing all over the place in all kinds of musical bags, jump blues, straight ahead jazz. He's been with a real deal hot club jazz band named Pearl Django for years. A lot of folks know him as a Telecaster evangelist, and I mostly know about him because of his stunning fingerstyle jazz guitar playing. He's a sought after teacher. He's got some really good True Fire courses and a True Fire channel. There's links to all that kind of stuff in the show notes. I know you're all here for the interview, so I'll get to it, but I need to tell you, this conversation went to surprising, almost spiritual territory a few times. Both Tim and I studied with Ted Green, and we talked about that. So if you're a Ted nerd, you'll enjoy that part too. Finally, please do subscribe. And also, if you need some clothes, buy yourself a shirt. Okay, here's Tim. Thanks for coming on the show. Well, maybe it's good to see you. It's a real treat. What's your first memory of feeling the magic of the guitar, that magnetic pull that you okay. can't let go of? Well, that's a good question. I, um, I think about this because it is not only my early musical memory, but maybe one of my very earliest memories of my life. And oddly, I'll share this with you, I'm not a big proponent of special energy or uh, you know, mystical things, but I swear to you that when I was a little kid, three or four years old, I heard a sound in my head that I wanted to make. And the first time I got a guitar in my lap, I went like this. What was that? You figured it out. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and I just heard that sound. I, I don't know if I ever heard it on the radio or whatever, but the first time I, I uh, got near a guitar, sitting in the back seat of my mom's station wagon, some, for some reason, she picked me up from school, but she didn't often do. And somebody, my sister or somebody, had a guitar. I remember it was on the Highland Street guitar, little three quarters. In no case, I picked it up, I sit in the back seat, and I went. My mom said, hey, Timmy, that sounds like something. <laughs> and then I didn't get a guitar for, maybe I was eight or nine then. And I didn't get an actual guitar. I got a harmonica somewhere along the line. I didn't get an actual guitar until I bought my own. My paper. I was Twelve. <laughs> and so, I mean, when you when you've had that happen in your hands, did you sort of have that, like, oh, I'm I'm doing this and? Yeah, it was interesting. I, you know, there. Sometimes just a, you know, a lightning bolt kind of comes out of the sky and you do something you don't really know what you're doing. You should not be able to do it, but you do it anyway. Yeah. yeah. And those kind of maybe a peak moment or something. What's the craziest thing you ever did in pursuit of the guitar? I mean, because you've, you've dedicated a lot of time to it, but what? I mean, it's all kind of crazy by conventional standards. Yeah. Uh, the, the thing that I've done in my life that I think most people would probably consider to be the craziest thing I've ever did, um, I didn't think it was crazy. It didn't feel crazy. In fact, it was a the antidote to craziness, but I, I stopped playing guitar. I lived in a monastery for about 12 years. Uh, I didn't play guitar during that time. Is that when you took your break? Yeah. Okay. I took my break. Um, and people say, what? Uh, you know, what did you do? You gave all that up. So that seems a little crazy, but I, in some ways, I, I did it in pursuit of a healthy mind and heart. But it turns out that didn't. I wasn't playing music joyfully because I didn't have a healthy mind and heart. And uh, got to the bottom of some of that stuff, and which makes it possible for me to play joyfully again. 
I'm going to have to ask you more about this later. This brings up a topic for me, but I'd love to see if I can find the courage to talk about it. Um, so, I mean, you sort of mentioned that the first time you, you got that note, uh, you sort of knew, but when was the first time maybe in your career when you felt like, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of getting in my own vein here. I've got, I've got a thing happening. It's interesting. Uh, I never had any doubt from the very first moment I thought I was going to be a musician. I just said, okay, I'm a musician. I wasn't any good. In fact, I wasn't a very good student. I wasn't, I, I loved it. I played all the time, but I wasn't very um, organized in my journey. Uh, and so I just proceeded from the age of about 12 or 13 with the assumption that I was going to be a musician. That was a no second guessing it, not yeah. a moment where you grew into it. It just, it was tough. Actually, <laughs> talk about this. I, I was in a conversation recently, uh, and uh, there was somebody was talking about plan B. You know, should I go to school and get a degree and do music or whatever? And it, out of my brain came, your fallback plan is a prediction. I believe that. Yeah. I believe that you life is without a net. If you have a fallback plan, any intelligent and logical person would try to be a musician for about 15 minutes and then crawl back because it's hard and it's it's hard on a number of levels. It's unprofitable most of the time. Uh, people don't understand it. So it's difficult. It's really hard. You have to have a conviction, a stubbornness and a Fiction. I'm a bit of a late bloomer because I, I, I had the ego that was necessary to pursue, <laughs> you know, being a musician, but I, I didn't always have, uh, that often got in the way. I wasn't, uh, when I was younger, I wasn't a very good listener. <laughs> I wasn't uh, very interested in crit criticism or, or even helpful. Yeah. So I think that's I, a learned skill, is learning how to accept right. critique. Right. And I, I fought tooth and nail for, you know, and the truth is I wanted to do something that a young man probably shouldn't be able to do or usually isn't able to do. I just had to get some life under my belt to be able to do what I do now. Um, and so I just took the course that we took. Hmm. Here I am, a uh, late bloomer, accidental YouTube star. <laughs> <laughs> YouTube famous. Do you, uh, do you ever reach sort of a point of satisfaction with your playing, or is it constant pursuit? Yeah, constant pursuit. I mean, to put up a finer point on, I hear something in my mind. I hear music, right? and um, I don't pursue music so I can sound like somebody else. Right? I pursue music, although there are some high water marks in my life that I admire: you know, Bill Evans, Ted Green, uh, Jim. Joe DiGiorgio, John Coltrane. I love those people. And I, and I digest their music deeply. But what keeps me going, I swear, is not the idea that I'm eventually going to be able to play as well as Bill and the Black Idol. That I'm actually going to be able to play as well as the, the guitar player that I imagine in my mind. <laughs> that I can have a guitar that sounds and plays as well and a technique that is adept enough to do the thing that I imagine in my head. That's all I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to... That's a healthy goal. Yeah. It's not small. Do it. I'm just trying to do what I I can imagine. And I think if I can imagine it, I should be able to do it. And and so, there you go. And then you have, you add to that the failure of the machine, the body's breaking down. But then as the body breaks down, and mind somehow clarifies and and maybe I don't have the chops I had when I was 18 years old or whatever, but I know what I want to play now. Yeah, it hurts to play too many notes, so I'll play yeah, the right, right notes. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Um, I'm just sort of curious, you have a guitar in your hand, uh, and I'm sure it changes from day to day, but is there some beautiful melody or set of chord changes that's just floating around in your head a lot these days? Um, it's, it's always changing. But at the moment,
When you hear these beautiful things, do they just sort of like run in your head for a while? And then you find yourself... It's, it, it, it's, it's challenging because I'm such an improviser that I, it's very difficult for me to capture that as a composition. But, you know, I, I do compose. Uh, I write two or three songs for all, all the Pearl Django records that I've been on and other projects along the way. Um, I don't mind doing it, but I don't do it. I, I, I'd rather do the thing that this music, just playing. I'd just rather just witness it coming out and flowing. Um, and was it always like that, or did you have to hit a certain level of proficiency to get there? Yeah, I couldn't. I, I couldn't hear it, and then I, and I also couldn't do it. So the couldn't hear it t turns into I can hear it, and over time, and the couldn't do it turns into I can do it, and then you just have to get those two things to meet. So there's a, a thing that happens with guitar players, probably all musicians, where you do, uh, you let your fingers do their thing and kind of stand back and listen. Or maybe you don't, maybe you just zone out or whatever. There's plenty of people that just do wiggling, you know. Um, and that's one kind of playing. There's another kind of playing where you actually hear something in your mind and then you have the skill and the wherewithal to find it. Uh, so how I practice, generally speaking, unless I'm learning some specific music for a specific game or a tune or whatever. The way I love to practice is I just play and I hear the melody, and sub subsequently I implied harmony uh, in my mind, uh, and I play what's I, what I'm hearing. And as soon as I, can, I as soon as I, my fingers go somewhere that my mind isn't sending them, or my mind sends my fingers to a place that doesn't sound like what I'm hearing, I stop and I figure it out. I play it, to clarify it in my mind, make a mental note about it in some fashion, and then I continue. That's the best I can do. I, I, I listen to so much music. I love so much music. I still listen to music, but I don't listen to music as background to my life uh, because it, that's already happening out here. All I, all I feel like the best thing I can do is try to play what I'm hearing. Yeah. And also, it, you know, maybe spend some time influencing my mind, hearing new things, and trying to find them, you know. I can hear pretty good, but pretty well, so I should say. I hear something on the radio and a piano player plays some sort of passage. I don't really need to write it down if it captures my mind. I can usually sing it and then I bring it to the guitar and I say, you know, and I think, oh, okay, that's like something like that. Yes. <laughs> I've been struggling with that personally. I'm, I'm a late bloomer would imply that I'm bloomed. Late blooming, I guess. Uh, but I've been trying to figure out, you know, am I, am I really ever going to have it together as an improviser? I can hear these things, and what it feels more like is composition. I have to refine the getting it out part. I can't just. Sometimes I get lucky, you know, you, 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 you hit the, the chord lottery and it comes out of your fingers or something. Yeah. But I've heard you play, you play well. You know, you're, you're, you're working on I have little pockets of things that make sense, but every once in a while, you know, I have a lot of ideas. I just don't know how to get them out. I think I'm not going to be able to improvise that. I'm going to have to figure out how to write it down. Otherwise, it, you know, I'm not sure. Sometimes the music goes by too fast and sometimes the hands go by too fast. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I'm, that's why I stop. Yeah. Soon I have to be really honest with myself. Sometimes the thing you play that isn't what you thought of still sounds good. So you have to make a kind of double assessment. Okay. That's okay. That one's good. It's not wrong just because it wasn't exactly what I thought. It has, it has validity. But I want to find out what I was thinking. I want to play what I was hearing in my mind because my fingers let me down for a minute. And so there's a couple of things. You're learning what to play. But you're also learning how to stay with the mental process which is in the, in the realm of imagining a sound and then instantly making that sound uh, and being able to hear both things simultaneously. It takes work, it takes practice. Yeah. And so part of the doing it, stopping, finding, and going forward is to strengthen that muscle. Yeah. Well, sometimes I wonder, you know, is there enough time to get it there? But that's my personal struggle is, you know, okay. There's a lot of guys who have their jazz jobs and it's you know, decades worth of work. I think maybe I just need to refine the ideas I'm having yep. and, and not try to improvise at right. all. Yeah, but well, that's choices you this, make. On this subject, I, um, uh, I have a, a meditation teacher, a Zen teacher, 
and he, he when when asked about this business of should I start or should I not, or anything, he says, uh, if you are going to walk across the desert, and it's a five day walk, and you only have three days worth of water, start walking. After three days, you die. Next life, you come back in and finish two more days. <laughs> Yeah. So it means, it, whether you believe in all that kind of stuff or not, doesn't matter. What it means is, if you're always waiting for the perfect opportunity to start on a path, you're never going to get it. You're never going to start. Yeah. Because there isn't a perfect opportunity. Rarely is there. Yeah. Just keep going. So just go. Yes. And be authentic in every stage of your learning. Because in addition to learning, you're also a musician. You're never, there's, you're never, you know, two things. Right. And so you're a musician who's learning. Or you're a musician who's playing. But you're always a musician, yeah. And and it's tempting to say, "Well, I'm not a musician until I learn such and such and such." Yeah. You're just a musician who hasn't learned such and such. Yeah. 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 And you're thinking of teaching this is helpful advice, not to make it a therapy session. But mm -hmm. thank you, everyone, for indulging me. Um, you know, you you do teach a lot, or you know, you. You, there's teaching in your life. I realize you're not taking you know, in-person students in that. And, and yeah, I still have a few, but I just don't want to take less of that. But I'm kind, of, I'm kind of curious, like, what is it that you take away from the, the experience of teaching? A lot of people don't do it, and I don't know if it's not fulfilling, but I mean, I assume there's like some financial security to it. Or, but, but like, what do you? There's got to be something that you're taking away from it. Yeah, it's, it is part of my income stream, and that has to be recognized. Um, something that I. <clears throat> Excuse me. Something that I'm skillful at, something that I've done a long time, and I don't mind. Uh, I think the relationship becomes more clear when there's uh, monetary exchange. Right. right. It makes it clearer for both of us, the student and the But what I, I'm a natural teacher. I'm one of these guys that if I learn something, the first thing I'm going to do is share it with somebody. Right. Um, and uh, just because I love that, I love sharing. Um, I share a lot of things. <laughs> I kind of a, uh, 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 I just, things come and go in my life because I like to give stuff away and help people. Uh, but um, I, I didn't have this always, but I, it's become clear to me. Uh, there's this saying that's very familiar, that you can't take it with you. And it's usually about, you know, use your life when you're alive because, you know, and don't, don't bother collecting things. Be kind and good to people, and have love in your life, so that when you, when you finally die, like we all do, you, you have that, you know. But because you, you can't take all that other stuff with you, all that accolades or money or things or whatever. But it occurred to me that there is one thing that you will take with you, which is knowledge that you have that you can share. And I don't even want to take that with me. Yeah. One time uh, I was at Ted's and uh, he wanted to show me something. And I've actually heard him say this to somebody else on a tape, but he actually said it to me too. Uh, maybe not about the same sub subject, but he said this very interesting thing. He was very excited. We were working on something really cool. And he said, you know, I was thinking about maybe keeping this to myself. But then I thought about it. I said, no, no, I'm going I'm to give it all away. Not really, I think. Right, because I get I can give something to you, and and by taking it from me, you don't take anything from me. You know? Yeah. I can share something with you, and I still have it in whole. In fact, maybe by sharing it with you, it becomes clearer for me. That's definitely true. From all the years of writing things down for my students, or writing uh, lessons, uh, trying to clarify something in my own mind so I could share it with my students. So my students have been my best teachers, you know, my most consistent teachers. What's your wish for your students? I try not to want anything for them, because then it becomes about me. So it's a hard, it's hard, but it, it, one of the things I tell myself is don't want anything for me. Of course, they're, you know, they're gonna, want, they have to want it. Right? So my job is just to try and be clear, patient, and kind, and share the material that I perceive would be the most helpful for them. But um, I feel like it's a, uh, 
it's kind of inauthentic in some way to want something. So wanting them to have success means I want something for myself. Hmm. Why do I want them to have success? So I feel better about how good of a teacher I am or how well I taught them. Maybe that's maybe that'll get in the way at some point. It's subtle, it's a slippery and subtly slippery slope, perhaps. Hmm. But I just I just come up with this notion that I can be most present with my student if I don't have an agenda of my own at the moment. Yeah. You know? Then I can really discover what it is they need to learn about in any moment, you know, or what they need to review or okay, ask that question again because I'm not sure I understand your question, so please try and ask it again so that I can get what you're really saying. And I give them that invitation to try and see more clearly what they don't understand about it or how to express something they don't understand. And a lot of times they learn a lot just by doing that. Just by me, by me saying, please ask your question again so that we can, you know, I can understand it better. If they answer, because if they can make it, me understand it, chances are they might be able to understand it themselves yeah. on their own. You know? Yeah, it sort of forces the, if you can pinpoint the thing you don't get, you actually gain, gain a whole lot of information right. about the parts that you Yeah, want. because, you know, when I was younger especially, but even now, if, I, if I'm interested in something and curious about something, I have to work on it. I have to find out, and I don't have a teacher that I can call up that knows everything or knows more than me necessarily, although there those people certainly exist, um, but uh, I'm not currently, you know, taking uh, uh, lessons from anybody else. So my, uh, the, as a result, I just have to do the research or find out for myself or listen more carefully or imagine more deeply to come up with something, you know. And um, I want my students to be to to learn that, not what scale to play, but I want them to learn by by their own and. Uh, engagement in the process, something that only they can learn, and maybe I can't even teach, right? Which is how to have the courage to create, hmm. you know, and imagine, you know, and follow through with it. So it's this, really is, this is so sweet. I feel so warmed <laughs> just hearing this. Um, your YouTube world. Uh, well, you mentioned you know you don't do that much gear stuff anymore but you, you did do a lot of gear things. You, you do a lot of teaching, almost like commentary. And you said maybe not maybe not motivation or coaching, but sensing, like it's a really, like not a lot of people, well, maybe a lot of people do that and it's not warranted, but you seem to be the guy that a lot of people in the guitar community trust to, to say those things. Uh, yeah, are you aware yeah. of that? I guess is what I'm well, wondering about. Um, yes. I. I I plant myself, I think, think about what would be useful, what would be helpful for there to be, what kind of content would be helpful on YouTube in the guitar music learning world. Um, and what I noticed is that there are people who are learning almost exclusively online and um, are getting very scattershot advice and information that they don't always understand and sometimes it's just plain wrong or wrong-headed um, and I thought well I don't want to necessarily call anybody out because I appreciate that most of the people on YouTube even if I don't agree with them they're sincere I don't think anybody's giving wrong information on purpose or information that I don't agree with it's not even wrong necessarily it's that, that's part of my sort of philosophy about this is that we're not necessarily trying to convince people that this is right and that's wrong. So what I, a role that I play sometimes in my life, you know, uh, often in my life is that of the, someone who uh, maybe shines light on the middle way, the, the, the way to proceed in the midst of seeming contrary ideas. Sometimes, especially in this current environment, you're either one of these or you're one of these, and these people think they're wrong, and these people think they're wrong, and there's no realm of compromise. We're in a very uncompromising uh, part of our culture right now. <laughs> um, 
So what I try and do is sort of be the voice of reason or the voice that might, uh, without trying to convince anybody of anything, without trying to get clicks, I just say, you might be over here, you might be over here, but remember there's a lot of stuff in between. And um, everybody in music anyway is a very personal thing. So even what might be considered the most correct music theory thing that you could learn at a conservatory is only correct in certain environments, is only correct in certain situations, is only uh, important in certain situations. And not everybody who's trying to learn how to play music is in those situations. Right. Okay? Um, and so what I try and do is give people encouragement to be themselves, learn in their own way, take charge of their own learning uh, without putting blind trust in anybody, even me, <laughs> right? So I try and raise the possibility of, a, of a, um, an even-handed reflection of possibilities, trust that somebody is um, going to get what they need. Uh, so, so I said in one of my more watched videos, I was talking about um, the, you know, how important it is to learn academically or not. And uh, what I ended up saying, it was a little snarky. I surprised myself because I'm usually not really snarky. But um, I said, look, I know somebody's going to say, well, Wes Montgomery didn't need to learn blah, blah, blah. But Django Reinhardt didn't need to learn blah, blah, blah. But guess what? You're on YouTube watching a video about how to play guitar. So you need some help. Yeah. And that's not, that's, that, there's nothing wrong with that. And we should help each other, you know. But to use the highest of high uh, watermarks of musical genius as an excuse to do or not do something on your in the path of learning is kind of silly right yeah so i you know bring people down to the earth if i can you know and you know with some humor and with some a lot of personal life experience uh in music and in general uh life etc because i'm such an old geezer now um i just try and be sort of even-handed and encourage people to find their authentic path and no one can tell them that what it is until they discover it, and then it's theirs. You know, uh, you can borrow a lot of things along the way, but when you want to own something, you got to get it for yourself, including how you want to approach music, and or if you want to approach music. You know, uh, I believe music is the kind of music I'm interested in is creative music. All music is somehow creative, but if you're reading you know, a score in a, in a pit, night after night after night, you don't really have much room to be creative. You're doing what you're told to do. And you might be very good at that. And you might bring a great deal of beautiful, beautiful expression to bring those black dots to life, right? Um, and so that's a kind of creativity, you know? It's a, it's a, a slice of it. Um, but a lot of people forget that, that you need to be creative you need to learn to be creative, or you need to nurture the, your creative impulses. Sometimes I think that the common thought process is that you practice hard, practice uh, diligently, organized, linear, and then all of a sudden, at some magical moment, you're going to go on a stage somewhere and suddenly be creative, be a genius or something. And it doesn't really work out that way. You've got to practice playing beautifully. You have to practice playing spontaneously. You have to give yourself room to learn how to do those things so that when you get the opportunity, it's already in place, it's already in motion, and it comes naturally, you know. Um, so this idea that pre not preaching what to do, not preaching what to think or whatever, right and wrong, but also just encouraging someone, there's a lot of information out there, test it. I know what's true for you. Look into it. Go further. Go deeper. But it's yours then, you know. Don't just swallow somebody else's stuff, especially on, on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Not everything's true on the internet. Yeah. Oh, right. yeah. yeah. Or, or 
you know, well said or, or kind or whatever it is. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to ask you before we get totally away from uh, teaching in your role of like sharing information with people, you've got this melodic chord dictionary. Yes, yes. Can you, uh, it's kind of a three part question in my mind. Okay. Uh, what is it? Mm -hmm. Why did you decide to use that approach? Yeah. And who is it for? Okay. Um, what it is, is it's a chord dictionary, uh, meaning that it's a collection of chord, of chord voicings. Um, the, I think the new mousetrap is how it's organized, because it may be that there's something like this that it already existed, but I didn't know about it. I, I, I still don't know about it. <laughs> so when I was approached to write a book, I was reluctant to do it. Um, there's so many good books already out there. And he said, well, I want, I'd like you to make a chord dictionary. And he said, no, quickly. Um, being a student of Ted Green and seeing chord chemistry and the legacy of that book and it not being really very helpful to many people. Some people idolize it, but they idolize it from a, <laughs> yeah. from the shelf, you know. Um, and uh, even Ted, you know, realized later on that it was somewhat misguided. Uh, it's still a beautiful document. And on page 56, there's a lot of wonderful, from page 56 to the end, a lot of wonderful teaching, but a lot of people don't even get to past page three because it's like four pages of any major triads, oh God. Um, anyway, I, the guy who asked me, I said no. He said, well, think about it. What, uh, what kind of chord dictionary would you like to write? If you had to write a chord dictionary, what would you write? And about for a minute, I said, I think it would be very valuable if a chord dictionary was arranged by the melody note of on the top voice of a chord. So we thought about that, and I, and I said that would be helpful. So when I'm learning how to play, not just a solo guitar piece, but let's say for that, for the uh, kind of a limited scope, I'm trying to play a song, and there's a melodic passage that's accompanied by a particular chord. Now look at the first note in the melody and the chord that goes with it. And I say, oh, that's an F with a C in the melody. So you can go to, to the table of contents. You could, there's some instructions. You could figure out that that C is the fifth of the F chord. Then you could say, down the table of contents, major chord, fifth in the melody on the third string. Major chord fifth in the melody on the second string. Mm -hmm. Major chord fifth in the melody on the first string. I see. And I limit it to the top three strings because that's a little practical. Right. More practical. That's where most of the melodic ideas are. So if you're looking, if you're if you've never, if you're baffled by how to make a solo guitar arrangement or how to harmonize a melody, you've never done it, you don't know where to start, you can start with that book. The book is um, so that's kind of what it is and why I wrote it. I was challenged by the idea, but then I realized it's, 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 it needs to be written because it's not out there, right? Organized, I mean, everybody buys a chord dictionary, at least some, you know, at some point in their life, you know, they, they sell well because they're kind of ubiquitous, you know, everybody yeah. needs one. <laughs> um, but nobody organized, it was like opening up the dictionary and all the A words were just randomly scattered in a, the first chapter. Right. They weren't alphabetized in the, the way that they all start with A, but what about the ones that say A, B, or A, A, and then A, B, C, and then, you know what I mean? That they alphabetize the content, so it's, you can find something, right? And so similarly, I wanted to make the book searchable. I, I, there's a few things that I wanted to do that we didn't do because of the function of the medium, but I wanted to make it so that you could find five easy ones at the top of the page and then more and more difficult once you go down. We chose not to do that because it was just too complicated. Maybe eventually I'll make a, like a, a crib sheet for it or something. Yeah. Um, but who it's for is anybody who's curious about, has to learn how to, wants to learn how to um, make, uh, have control over the melodic content of a chord progression. Whether it's for comping, Right? I mean, I, 
I want I want to be able to do that if I ever want to do that. And those chords aren't fixed grips. They're not memorized. This one isn't another one, then that one isn't another one. So I just figured you kind of have to present it as fixed grips at first. But then the, the big encouragement is to liquefy it. Fluid harmony, that's right. a little catchphrase. Yeah. So that, I hope that answers. Yeah, that. it does. Um, I, have to, I have to look at this book carefully, I think. There's also um, you know, some transcriptions of my playing. There's a systematic approach to harmonize scales in there. The V system that mm -hmm. I modified from Ted's you know, magnum opus. I simplified it so that it was, more again, more practical. Um, and just some other stuff in there that is helpful when there's four hours of masterclass videos that you can watch that support the material. So I think it's a very good value. Yeah. We'll put links. Oh, okay. Pe people can go find it. Easily. We also have a new book coming out because one of the things that we, feedback we got was a couple of people said, well, I thought this was going to be like some phrases, chordal phrases. And I'm disappointed, you know, because they, they didn't read it closely enough that it said dictionary on there. <laughs> uh, but not very many people, but a few. So it got us to thinking. And so we thought, well, maybe the next book needs to be melodic chord phrases. So coming up in just a couple of weeks, fall of 2023, uh, Guitar Vivo will release a second book. And it's going to be called uh, Melodic Jazz Guitar Chord Phrases. And uh, it's just my stuff you know yeah. yeah it's going to be great i think it's going to have you know little pathways or melodic pathways right. that, and i think uh, once you, know, you get some of those in, under your hands it's the, the idea of it starts to make sense right. you get courage yeah, you get yeah. Courage. and i i wish it was twice as long but the, the limits of the page count and all that stuff really made me focus on the essentials i gotta ask you about this um you know, you mentioned that you were a bit of a, sounds like maybe a spiritual seeker, something at some point in your life. I've um, been thinking a lot about meditation in the flow state. And uh, I think um, I think for a lot of years, I've sort of employed music or guitar, like in the wrong way. Okay. Like I've sort of felt like it was, like it was supposed to save me or it was gonna help me escape something. Mm -hmm. And uh, for, I always thought the high point of music was going to be like that moment where you get up on stage and you play and you go blank and like brilliance comes through you and you're not even there. And um, it can happen. I, yeah. Well, there's, there's, I, I'm on this slippery slope. There's like, there's this transformation and transcendence. But to me, that it's just starting to feel more like I just don't want to be me anymore and I want to go somewhere else. And I was trying to figure out when you're playing your best music. Do you, are, do you feel present in the moment or do you feel like you're a conduit for something else? And is there a healthy way to think about this? Well, I hope you don't mind me asking that deep I will, question. I will, it's been on my mind a lot. Yeah, I will try. It's, it, it is a, it's a conversation that is hard because the language is built around opposites and the experience is uh, the experience of no opposites. So to use opposites language to describe something where opposites don't exist is impossible. But I'll share a few things that might be helpful. Okay. When I was a young man in my 20s, I was playing music with a trio in a, just a rehearsal, get together, hey? And I had an experience where, what you described, uh, we were playing, we were improvising, it was going really well, and all of the mundane thinking fell away. And I had an experience of sort of floating up above and, and witnessing this activity. Um, and then it ended, and you know, as soon as I realized something special was happening, it poof. And then I spent the next, I don't know, however many months, maybe years, trying to recreate that. Because I had this beautiful experience and I wanted it again, you know. Because it's special when something like that happens. Some kind, any kind of peak experience affects us really deeply. Uh, but I started noticing that I was trying to use the music to get that thing, that experience. And it appeared maybe because of something I was reading or my sort of uh, juvenile um, meditation practice maybe pointed me to realizing that I didn't want to use the music for anything other than the beauty of the music. I didn't want to 
be involved in trying to use the music to get something. So then I thought, well, if I'm not going to use music to get that, what can I do? So I took my uh, sort of infantile meditation practice a little more seriously and uh, eventually, you know, found a teacher who could help him get over some of the battles and struggles. Um, so but that was very important that the music is uh, given room and, and space to exist on its own merits, not for the purpose of making me something, making me famous or making me well liked or making me money or making me happy or any of those things. And those will happen, some of them <laughs> that will happen. But um, playing music for its own sake, I think is very important for being healthy in the activity. And it'll come and go. It came and went for me and to do some course correcting. Um, but when the music is has its own reason for being and it's not for my benefit necessarily, although I will benefit from it, uh, I can do it and relate to it in a much more healthy way. Um, so the nature of this falling away is that let me see if I can do this. Uh, opposite thinking starts very, very early on. It starts with I and you. That when we're very young, we see, we see the world through the lens of I'm over here and it's all out there. Yeah. We're indexing everything around. It's not wrong, it's human. Yeah. Right? Um, but the state you're talking about is when that, that uh, foundational thinking which we don't even know what we're doing, falls away for a moment or a second or some timeless, because time also falls away. So everything falls away, including my idea about myself and how I see myself in music and blah, 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 do they like me, do they not? All that stuff falls away. When it all falls away, you're in the realm of the moment, you're in the realm of no this and that. Right? There's not I and it, there's not like and dislike, there's not good and bad, there's not high and low. And, and um, so to, just, to talk about it, even to the extent that I'm talking about it now, which is very risky, uh, especially when I don't know who the audience is going to be, um, it, it is You're to hear for <laughs> next, next to impossible to describe it um, without making a whole bunch of jargon that right. someone would have to, you know, buy into. So. Those kinds of peak experiences happen. You can't force them to happen. You can be open to that. You can prepare yourself for staying with something when it, uh, when when you, when things fall away. You know, if the tendency is <laughs> good, then you're done. Right? But if you're really willing to stay with something, usually you stay with, you know, a difficult thing. That's the training. But when you can stay with something that is open like that. Then, then you can, uh, you know, find out how to deepen your appreciation. But you can never buy into the notion that you're always going to be there in that state. And that it's a state that you can cultivate or get, uh, and because it's very dangerous, it becomes like attachment to special energy and those right. kinds of things. Right. Don't worry, just keep just keep playing and let it go where it needs to go. Yeah, well, I think I, I want to be more mindful about, you know, treating the music with the reverence that the music deserves. I'm not trying to yeah. think about, you know, right. are you fixing myself? But listen, I want to be more mindful. That's a couple of really big mistakes in it. I want oh. more. Yeah, so mindfulness doesn't have I want or more. <laughs> So be careful. Yeah, right. Oh, this feels so wonderful to talk about. Thanks for going down the rabbit hole with me a little bit. Uh, I want to talk with you about uh, Ted. Um, Ted Green. Uh, if you don't know who Ted Green is, you know, just look him up in YouTube yeah, yeah. And, or on the internet. You'll find out really quick. But uh, I studied with him briefly. I was probably too young to know what was good and what I should have been focusing on. It was just one of those lucky things where I got to study with Ted. I, it, couldn't have it couldn't have been a better accident. Yeah. Uh, and it, it did change my life in a lot of ways. And um, 
I know you studied with Ted. I wanted to just ask you about well, what, when, when, and how long did you study with Ted and get? Not very long, actually. Yeah. Um, it was, it wasn't, I wasn't living in the neighborhood, so it was, it was difficult for me to get to him. First, we did lessons by mail, which she was slow at, but he wrote me a beautiful handwritten letter and, a, and included, you know, a, a couple of pages or more pages. Uh, and I, I just still cherish those. Uh, and then I, when I would uh, go to Los Angeles from Northern California for a holiday or something, I would set up a lesson and go to his house, his parents' house in Woodland Hills at the time. And that would be in 82, 83, um, 84, I moved down there. Still didn't have a car, but I went over to his house. This, when he finally moved out of his parents' house, he lived on uh, in apartment number nine in Cedar? No. Oh, uh, the, I don't remember the, the name. Was El Dorado. Yeah, 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 El Dorado. Yeah. Where, whatever town that was in. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. They never felt like towns to me. They just felt like areas that we got a name. But I yeah. can't remember what the name of that particular neighborhood, neighborhood was. Yeah, it was off White Oak or something. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, would, I was very diligent. He knew I was capable and a little precocious and, and, you know, kind of full of myself. So he gave me a lot of work. And he'd send me off and I'd come back months or two months or three months later after I'd gotten to the bottom of what he gave me. Um, and then and then I um, went down to L.A. to go to GIT and went there, uh, studied with Jyoti Oreo and Ron Estate for the most part. And I would occasionally go to TED's. I, I got on the sub list, so, uh, you know, if uh, someone needed couldn't make their lesson, he would, he would ask you to send a sub. Right. So I, I went to a number of lessons as a sub. Uh, and I collected the material, and then later on, a friend of mine gave me a stack of stuff that other people had gotten and were sharing it around. Then I started going on the road and planning for a living and doing all the stuff, and I didn't, uh, I couldn't go and see him anymore. So the last time I saw him was probably 86 or maybe 87. Um, and then I moved away uh, up to Seattle from Los Angeles and didn't see him anymore after that. Um, so unlike some of the, you know, there are some uh, notable uh, TED students who went week after week for some period of time or month after month, a lot of us just would, you know, go and grab something and work on it, you know. And I continued to work. Somebody asked me, how long did you study with TED? And I said, including today, yeah. up until now. Yeah, uh, yeah. 50, 50 years. <laughs> he did give some assignments, you know, we'll yeah. come back when you systematically work through right. all of them. Yeah. Well, that, that, that might take forever. Yeah. 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 Um, I guess music aside, what, did you have any big takeaways from Ted? I mean, I, I can add, I, I'll ask you about music too, but were there other life yeah. things you yeah. had? Yeah. Ted? Ted was the first adult man who, uh, was more about kindness than, than um, one-upsmanship or insult or braggadocio or, you know, all the men I knew were kind of always poking at you, you know, and trying to be better than everybody else and whatnot. Um, or they were stern and, you know, they were... Uh, and Ted was very kind and uh, somewhat complimentary, uh, enough to give me encouragement. Um, and. Uh, straightforward, but never mean about it. He was even keel with me. I've heard that he wasn't, you know, an angel. And, you know, he'd get on his last nerve and, and he'd let you have it or something. But um, never with me. I, I, so he seemed to me like uh, a guy who was really, uh, I mean, I wanted to be like him. That's all I can think of. He's just like someone, you know, we, we meet somebody and we want to, we like him so much, or that we admire him so much, it makes us want to be a better person. And I know a few people in my life that are like that, and Ted was definitely maybe the first one person I met like that. Yeah. Uh, Joe DiOrio, definitely, which was, I met right after first meeting Ted, also it gave me that sense. Uh, a kind of uh, respectful uh, way of being, but never afraid to you know, tell the truth. Yeah. 
I, will, well, I mean, I think everyone wanted to be like Ted, you know, leave us in its room. And, There's even a t shirt that says be like Ted. Yeah, I, I had one of those once one time. And I remember he used to he used to give this advice. It was something like, you know, well, you don't you don't always have to practice with the guitar in your hand. You could practice at home, and you know, you know when you're lying at the supermarket, and you can systematically work through all this stuff. And if you just think about it, 24 hours a day, every day, you know, sooner or later it'll build up in your mind. And uh, and I remember I I try. I, I remember thinking I wanted to be like Ted, but I, I didn't quite have the discipline to do it 24 hours a day. Right. And it was on, I read a book, uh, I think it was by his longtime girlfriend, and I realized that it was actually kind of freeing for me. Ted couldn't turn that organization thing no, off in his no, head. No. Um, he, he wasn't doing that on discipline. He was doing that on like some sort of base functional part of his brain. Right. And I suddenly I felt, I felt no, okay no. thinking, you know, I can take the lessons he learned, but I can't be like Ted because I'm not Ted. <laughs> Yeah, he was a, a unique uh, person, in, at least in my experience. Uh, and it wasn't all, you know, um, happy times. You know, he uh, sometimes his obsessive nature, you know, got him into a little trouble and made things difficult for him, and made it hard for him to relate to society at large, and yeah. all those kinds of things. And there's stories about that. I don't know if that everything in that book uh, that you talk about, the Cord Chemist, by his partner Barbara. Barbara, yeah. Um, some people think it's the you know the written word and to be believed. I think a lot of it is just you know her perspective on it, and you have to remember that it's her perspective on it. Yeah. Uh, you know, just one person's view into. And of course, they were close, and she probably knew them very well. But she also had you know her own wants and needs. In, yeah. In, yeah. So. Well, I read it fifteen. You know. Years and years yeah, later, yeah. Or I don't know how many years it was, but yeah. it was certainly it's nice to have because there's a lot of stuff in that book that we didn't know about before. You yeah. know, like that, all the stuff he wrote is listed in that book. Yeah, uh, musically, uh, I mean, Ted, you know, musical genius, and you've carried on the torch in a lot of ways with that sort of comprehensive understanding of chord knowledge and moving voices. But were there key takeaways that Ted set you on the what, musical takeaways that you said you're yeah. still unpacking some of them? What are they? Yeah, yeah. Um, the thing I like most, that captured me most about Ted is the sound he made and the, the lush and beautiful quality. The, the groove was relaxed, he was never hyper, he was never feeling like he's chasing anything. Um, it was fat, deep, and soulful, and, but also just harmonically and melodically luscious, you know. Um, the first lesson I went to it to see him in person, I played a little arrangement. He wanted me to play something, so I said, I'll try and recreate my, you know, 22-year-old body and soul. Wow. Etc. Not bad for, you know, first try. But then he said, well, Tim, why don't you try this? Get a little movement in there. All right. Okay. I'll have that piece. <laughs> and he just showed me this first move. All right. And, all, and, I, and then I, I'm on the path. Long notes, sustain against movement. All right. Inner movement. Melody being beautifully played, bass line supporting the tempo. That's, that's the musical message. I had an epiphany uh, during my time away. Uh, YouTube came out and I, um, I got a chance to watch YouTube. And of course, the first thing I looked for on there was you know, something about Ted. And there was a man who, I don't know if he's still making videos, but he made a bunch of videos of Ted's arrangements. Well, maybe not a bunch, maybe three or four. And I listened to it and I, I knew some of the arrangements and it didn't sound anything like Ted. It sounded like a guy with an ES-175 and a polytone amp and flat one strings playing chord melody. So I thought, what the heck? What is Ted doing? It's not, obviously it's not the voicings necessarily, but there's something going on 
that Ted's doing that this gentleman, as good as he is, isn't doing. And it turned, it, it, I, I, I thought, well, what is it? Let's listen, let's do it really listen. And it turns out that it's the long notes, the held notes against moving notes, the independence of the fingers, the, the, the lack of uh, transitional gaps where you need a certain amount of a nanosecond or more to get to the new chord grip and to get to the new chord grip. So you say, okay, here's something. It looks like black and white dots on a grid page. Or whatever. Well, that, that's what it looks like. But what Tim Ted would play it, it would be... Right? Uh, all of them, everything would be connected. And, and um, I didn't do, even do it justice, you know, because he had special powers. But on a low-tune guitar, you know, good, good hand control and sustained notes against moving notes, the illusion is, starts to appear. And that's a lot of what Ted did was an illusion. It's not that it was. It's not that he had access. Ed Bicker, it's the same way. Ed deals with the same twelve notes that we all deal with, you know, and a lot of the same grips. But he just plays them in a way that has a certain personality, and it has to do with the length of the note, the independence, placement. Uh, Ted said one time to me, he said, Tim. You invite a note into existence. You, you uh, decide what its life is going to be like, and you decide when it dies. And then sometimes four or five notes simultaneously. But that's what we're doing. We shorten the strings. We decide how to make them sound, how long they're going to last, whether we're going to do something to them yeah. while they ring, and then we decide when they die. So. That's really, it's almost like a different aesthetic awareness, though. It's sort of like, it's not really about the notes or the can you put your fingers on them. It's about, it's like, we're going to have these fluid lines and you're going to do whatever it takes yeah, right. to make them fluid. Right. Right. Um, um, I do have a question. Do you have any other musical ideas or arenas that you feel like you need to get to? Or have you found a place that you're comfortable inhabiting and you really want to focus your energy there? Um, let's see. I just made a record of singing. I heard you sing earlier. I, yeah. I've heard you sing before, but it was like, it was incredible. People keep saying, well, you've got to make a record. And I said, I know I've got to make a record. I've been trying to make this record since I was 17 years old. But a 17 year old can't make a blues record. Yeah. You just can't. You know, or you turn out like one of these phenoms that's sort of maybe overcompensating in one direction because they can't really come to the music with any kind of authenticity. But I really like Mose Allison, and I really uh, just really fixated on him for a period of time. And I've been trying to make this record of those songs, the Percy Mayfield material, the most uh, originals, the classic kind of Nat King Cole standards and stuff, singing and playing, and I've made that record. So I don't think I need to make another one like that, because uh, I'm kind of tapped out. You know? yeah. It's hard to find good songs to sing, you know, and I collected about 20 of them in my life, and I sing them still. Um, so there's that. I um, am constantly interested in uh, paring things down to their beauty and essential, uh, their essential beauty. So instead of having something big and fat and full of, you know, multiple, as George Van said, six string elephants, you know, I want to continue the process of stripping things down to their essentials and it you know, ends up being counterpoint you know, poly polyphony in the realm of line work rather than thinking of chords only mm -hmm. or being able to say just a passage like that you might see it right and I want to hear And it's like it's like a most multi-dimensional line where you're holding some notes rather than just playing them individually. Yeah. yeah. I find that to be fascinating, and I, I'll never completely dispose of 
on my other habits, but I really want to continue working on, on improvised polyphony, poly polyphony, you know, the, the, the counterpoint, the improvised counterpoint, whether it be with other musicians or just on my own. Um, yeah, you know, that kind of covers a lot of territory. And I don't think I need to like, you know, I don't have any desire to, you know, you know, get back in the stand in front of a loud band and play the blues or a right. fusion genius or I mean, as much as I love all that stuff, I realize I'm getting less. I'm going toward less rather than always trying to go for more. I really want to be able to play these beautiful songs that I love and maybe uh, write, you know, my own songs that have those qualities and just play them in this sort of, I don't know, just essential way that isn't, it doesn't have any, anything unnecessary in it, you know? Yeah. So it's a stripping away rather than adding in. And I'm, I'm not there, so I know that I have uh, some job security. So to do. Well, I'm doing it, yeah. but it's it's job security. You know? yeah. uh, this is kind of a big question, and I don't know where you'll take it, but what does the guitar mean to you? Yeah. <laughs>